more time. How about now? Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, now you're back. Our community's mission statement is to create a community was, that was created by, our, uh, excuse me, I'll start. Our mission statement was created by our community and adopted by our board. And that mission was to provide an equitable and quality education that meets the individual needs of our students to thrive in the 21st century. If we take a look back at 1935, when our facilities were first built, we can see things have changed quite a bit. The automobile industry has changed quite a bit to the point where we now have self-driving cars. This also applies to farm equipment. And while I see many of our farmers working in the fields, driving combines and tractors, uh, in some parts of the country, they're already run by GPS systems and satellite systems. If we take a look at assembly lines, you'll notice that in the top right corner that we see a line of people working on an assembly line. Right next to it is a modern day assembly line where there are no workers. Those processes have been automated and there are lots of jobs, but they've changed. Your smartphone is a great example of that and how a camera has changed between 1935 and the wonderful things that it can do today. Technology has changed. The way we train students and the future, the future leaders of our world has changed and our facilities and our educational programs need to adapt with that. GFW, GFW facilities were first built in 1935. You can see in the left side, this is a picture of a single room schoolhouse, and this is what education used to look like. All grades together. In 1935, we were just starting to move into grade level classrooms. If we take a look on the right, we see a very different model. In 1935, a teacher stood in the front of the room and told people what to remember, and then they, they told that teacher what it was that they remembered. That is very low order thinking. I can go to Google and do the same thing. Nowadays, teachers are facilitators of learning. We work together in groups. We give students knowledge and we ask them to apply that to real world situations to transform learning, to transform thinking and think about how they can change the world and how they can lead in the future. Our community told us through our strategic planning process and our board adopted what our community asked us for, which was to establish a facility plan. So what is our story? I really like the picture in the top right corner. This goes back a little ways to when GFW was the first district in the state to adopt one-to-one -one iPads, to use a different type of tool to transform learning for students. Now, most districts across the state have one-to-one -one devices. We started working together as independent school districts of Gibbon, independent school district of Fairfax, independent school district of Winthrop eventually sharing resources and merging to GFW public schools. But from that moment forward, we set a course to where we are today. The decisions we made were eventually to lead us to a crossroads of where we have to address our facilities. And we've been doing that over the last few years. Some information on enrollment. GFW public schools has something called a capture rate of 79%. That means how many of your students are you retaining? And I've heard stories about our students are going all over the place, right? We got eight buses coming in here, there, there, going out to there. Um, I'll tell you what, the state average is 80%. You, re you retain 80% of your students. We're at 79. We're very average. We're normal. Minnesota has student choice. They can choose to go where they want to go. We're average in terms of how many students stay. I've also heard that we don't have any students left and that district doesn't, our district doesn't have a future. Well, we're in the top two thirds of enrollment in the state of Minnesota. So what are the enrollment numbers? I've seen lots of different numbers around. These are the accurate numbers of our enrollment. As of today, at this moment, 615 students, kindergarten through 12th grade, were at school here at GFW Elementary School, Middle School and High School. We've been talking through our survey information about a pre-K-12 because we service not just K-12, but early learners as well. Today, 677 students pre-K through 12 are enrolled at GFW public schools. A year ago, 689 students were at GFW public schools. That's a difference of 12. By the end of last school year, we had 714 because as 
students get older and they become eligible for pre-K, they start enrolling with us. So our numbers go up throughout the year. So if we just take the difference of 12 and apply it, we're still looking at about 700 students, which is what we're projecting to have pre-K 12. This is what we communicated last spring and what we are still on track to do. The MD report card, which is a state verified number, said we had 620, uh, 624 students K-12 last year. In regards to our facilities, we asked our communities if they want us to fix up a building in each site. Did that make sense? Repair the Fairfax building, repair the Gibbon building, repair the Winthrop building. The cost at that time was $39 million and 81% of people said no. They were not interested in fixing up our buildings. So a task force went back to work. But while that happened, our facility needs continue to go unaddressed. Our fund balance was declining from deficit spending and families became frustrated, frustrated with inaction of our district able to take a step forward with facilities. And so some students did leave. We asked the public a question, November 5th of 2019, on their interest on our pre-K-12 facility. And we can see that this was a step in the correct direction because 45% of people said yes to this concept, which was a $49 million question. This question failed. Had we passed that question, we would be able to stave off a lot of costs because of the inefficiencies of running multiple buildings. Maple River is a great example of that. Um, they're going out for an operating levy right now, and they're just looking for a renewal, not an increase. The reason why is because they're saving almost a million dollars a year in efficiencies. They don't need the extra operating levy in order to do that because they're in a single site. A pre-K-12 solution is a good solution for a district this size because it runs at the lowest cost and it's the most fiscally responsible with our taxpayers. But we didn't pass that question. As a result, we went into statutory operating debt. We were projected to have a negative 12% unreserved fund balance. We had staff reductions. We reduced programming and educational opportunities for students. Our facility needs continue to go unaddressed and we even had to close a building. And that's a really hard thing. In any community, anywhere, any size, when you close a building, that is hard. That is emotional. So on August 11th of 2020, we asked the community to pass an operating levy. You can see that 302, that's very similar to what Maple River actually has right now. I believe it's around 280 or something that they're asking for per pupil. Um, and replace it with a $1,406 operating levy. This passed with an overwhelmingly 63% yes and added close to three quarters of a million dollars to our budget. Thank you very much to the community for doing that. We really appreciate that. And I think what's really important to look at is that 63% of people voted yes. That is a very high number for an operating levy. That is very high. And what that tells me is that 63% of our community wants their kids at GFW public schools. They want their neighbor's kids at GFW public schools. They want their grandkids at GFW public schools. <clears throat> Interestingly, the efficiencies that we would receive by moving into that pre-K-12 would have been about $750,000. So had we passed a single site, just like Maple River, we could have maintained the programming we had at that time and moved into a single site and solved a lot of our issues. But we didn't choose that path. So this is a path we have. And we've seen some great things because of that with some of our new program, which our public has said that they wanted through our strategic planning. Because of that new funding, we exited statutory operating debt. We were able to keep our schools open safe during open and safe during the pandemic. We also reviewed our facilities to see if we had made good choices along the way and what future decisions we needed to make differently. And we did a listening tour asking our public, what do you want education to look like at GFW public schools? And they told us. We went from a negative 12% projected fund balance to a positive 12% fund balance, which is where our auditors tell us we should be at. We added over 100 new student opportunities, including classes in agriculture, engineering and manufacturing, business, arts, communication, entrepreneurship, health sciences, human services. We've received national recognition for our work through multiple different publications. GFW is a strong district. In fact, I'll say that differently. GFW is a strong district exclamation point. 
we are leading the way in many ways. We are strong, we are healthy, but our facility needs have continued to go unaddressed. The community said in our strategic plan, they want us to focus on facilities as well as a lot of the different programs that we've added. So based on their feedback and what the community told us, we have moved forward with those steps. In regards to consolidation, on January 13th of 2021, the boards, the board chair and superintendent of BLH and Bold met and issued a letter stating that they are not interested in consolidating. On March 21, GFW had a conversation about that letter, made a motion, seconded in that motion and passed not to consolidate, to communicate, yeah, to share resources, absolutely, you do that when you're in regions, all districts do that, but not to consolidate. No district was interested in consolidation. The board has given me direction not to work on consolidation, and that is the direction we have moved, and that's the, that's the direction we're continuing to move. July 2022, the school board made a motion to work towards a pre-K-12 option in one or more phases. For the reasons I said, it's the most efficient model, something centrally located, which should only be eight to 10 minutes away from our major cities, given, I'm sorry, uh, Winthrop and Fairfax. I Just to confirm this information, just to make sure nothing changed, I called the superintendents a week ago from Bold, and BLH and said, has, any, has your position changed? And the answer was no. We talked to the Minnesota School Boards Association about GFW consolidation. We, Minnesota School Boards Association has 100% membership of all public schools. And they said there's absolutely no reason that GFW should have to consider consolidation at our size. They said they have lots of member districts that are much smaller and they're doing great. So why are facilities in the conditions that they are? We receive roughly $270,000 for long-term facility maintenance revenue. What that means, if I take a building, if I was strong enough to pick it up and turn it upside down and shake it, anything that falls out does not get covered. Anything that stays in, like the doors, the carpet, things like that, we can use long-term facility maintenance funding for. The state does not provide adequate funding for greater Minnesota schools. What they do offer us is the egg to school credit, which covers 70% of a facility bond. So if I'm a farmer and I qualify for the egg to school credit, 70% is covered through this credit. This is one of the strongest pieces of bipartisan legislature has come through. It's a law. It's not renewed annually. It's a law. It's like driving on the right side of the road. It's a law. Last legislative session is introduced to go to 100%. <clears throat> It made it to the final package at 85%. And that's where legislators we've talked with already are talking about it coming back at. I'll show you how that impacts things later. This is not just the superintendent saying this. This comes from the, uh, this goes from MREA, which represents rural districts across the state. And they say the same thing. We don't get enough. And that needs to be part of our legislative advocacy is getting more long-term facility maintenance revenue. Some districts in our state get $1,024 per pupil. And the reason why they get that amount is because that's what the statute allows for them. They're under a different part of the law. The average school district in our state gets 560, GFW gets $380. It's not fair. It's not fair to our taxpayers. It's not fair to our students. It's not fair to our community. It's not because we're the size or where we're located. It's just what the statute does. So we need to work on that. But this is our reality. We understand that we can't do all of our repairs with LTFM. So we have to look at other options. So we asked our public, where are you at right now? Where are you thinking with the survey in the spring of 2022? Would you support us just going out for a question? 52% of people on average said yes, more parents than um, non-parents. We asked about a centrally located facility at $70 million. Our parents, 56% said yes, 46% overall. So a little short of that 50% mark. 42% said no, 
with about 11% undecided, not sure, not sure how they felt about that. They needed more information. We asked for a lower dollar amount. We thought maybe a lower dollar amount might play differently. So we asked that question. And interestingly, more people didn't want the lower dollar amount. If we we're going to do it, they said, go do it, go do it. Only 23% of people said do the 512. Our tax threshold is very split. It's very binary. You can see there's a lot of people that are saying, hey, 70, 80 million. Yeah, go for it. And then you see down at the bottom, I won't support anything at all. And there's 33%. Interestingly, that matches up really well with our operating levy. When I said 63% of people support GFW and want a school district here. And there was 37% that said no to that question. Very similar numbers. That tells us something. There's also 13% out there that said we need more information. Teddy Roosevelt said, in any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The next best thing you can do is the wrong thing. And the worst thing you can do is nothing. Let's take a look at our facilities. Krauss Anderson did the facilities assessment. They looked at all parts of our building, substructures, shell exterior, HVAC equipment, interior. And this is what they found. In today's dollars, and this red number is the key number to take away from the slide, we need to invest $31.2 million into our facilities, not to improve them, but just to get them back to where they're supposed to be, $31.2 million. This does not include any improvements for like educational adequacy. This is in today's dollars. We see that interior construction in the blue is a large portion of that. Roofing, exterior enclosures, site work, HVAC, indoor air quality. So how critical are these repairs? Well, as you can see from this pie chart, a large percentage is currently critical. On this slide, if you take a look at this picture, those circles represent something where we need to address an issue. I can't count how many circles are on there because there's too many and there's too many that overlap. And this is our middle school, high school in Winthrop. It needs a lot of work. To quantify this, Carlos Anderson uses something called an FCI, a facility condition index. Anything from 0.5 to 1 on a one-point scale is critical. 0.5 to 0.31 is poor, and so on and so forth. So it's a zero to one scale. The closer the one you are, the worse you are. Closer to zero, the better. The elementary school is the better of our two sites. It's scored at a 0.39, which is poor needing nine, almost $9.7 million. Again, not to improve, just to kind of bring it back. It was constructed in 1935 with renovations in 1953 and 1977 with a square footage of just under 67,000 square feet. We are poor and we're approaching critical. Things that are wrong, roofing, our basement floods. It floods so much that you could actually blow up a raft and you could go canoeing in there in the summer. We get that much water. Tuck pointing, windows, interior construction. So this is our roof condition. Anything in red needs to get replaced. We've been fixing it. We do get some LTFM and we do try with everything that we have. We have some funding available and we utilize that funding, but it's not enough. The red represents areas that need some attention. Indoor air quality, this is really big, especially with COVID. Keeping our students healthy, our staff healthy. Now let's take a look at our middle school, high school. This one scored worse at a 0.44. This is poor and very close to critical. This is over a $21 million repair. 
first, when I first started here, I was touring the site and I walked out to the track and the track coach was walking laps. He was carrying a bucket, a big green bucket. And I was trying to figure out what is the tra track coach doing with a bucket? Like I figured maybe he was carrying blocks or shoes or something. He's carrying tar and he was putting tar down on the track because there's such big gaps there that the kids toes would go in there and they could break their ankles if they ran across that without him filling that. And it washes out every year. So he has to go repair it. Our windows need to be replaced. Our roofs need to be replaced. <laughs> asbestos we have lots of work to do over there this is the condition of our roof as you can see it needs a lot of work this is our upper level which by the way when we talked about non-discriminatory education we can't utilize parts of our buildings because we don't have elevator access fire marshal says you can't use that for classes there is a staff member was telling me a story about how a child couldn't go outside because we didn't have access through a ramp. You know, they could go around this whole school building. We had access over there, but they couldn't get out. Or to our playground, our paraprofessionals come to me and say, so-and-so wants to get out there, but I don't have a path because I, we're not ADA compliant or accessible. These are issues. Again, you can see all the red here for the interior construction. It's a lot of work that needs to be done. Lower level. HVAC system is fair, but needs to get worked on. In fact, this is actually what some of the work is we have already approved is that we need to be continuing to work on our indoor air quality, try to stay current and ahead of it. So that, that's some of the projects that we're currently doing. We also looked at our bus garages. We have two in Fairfax and a house. Then there's the Winthrop bus garage and the Given bus garage. That adds another $350,000. And then, as I said before, with the, this is just like, like for like for like replacement. In order to meet current ASHRAE standards and air quality standards, we actually need an additional $5.1 $5 million to bring our air quality up to where it's supposed to be. The assessment summary is that our students are safe today, but we're approaching critical. And based on this assessment, when you reach critical, these are these become safety concerns, and you can see we're right on the edge. Any type of facility project would take many years to get started with scope of work and complete. And if we don't do some things now, we're putting our staff and our safety at a potential risk. The total cost of that, plus the two million already approved by our school board earlier this summer, is 8.6 million. Using current inflation projections, by the time we could actually get that work done, because we can't just drop it and make it happen today. We have to schedule that over many years. We have students in session. That can only be done over the summer. That would add additional money to on it. So that brings us to $50.1 million in repairs, not to improve, just to, just to get caught up. If we were to address the educational inadequacies that we have, that adds, that's like actually improving the spaces to do the type of learning we want to do, to keep our students safe, to, um, you know, we have a, a, there's a gym lease over there in Fairfax, that property is not being maintained. Um, what are we going to do? Well, to address all those needs, we need an additional $22 million, which brings our total to 72 million point one. And this isn't including land acquisition. If we need to add, we're landlocked. So if we needed more land, we possibly need to purchase land, we haven't talked about furniture or any of those other pieces. So there's additional costs that could be in there. The cost to fix our current facilities is 71.8% of the cost of a new pre-K-12. I'll say again, to fix our current facilities is 71.8% of the total cost for a new pre-K-12, a, a brand new building. If we add in the educational inadequacies, it's more expensive to fix than it is to build new. And if you've ever done anything at your house, you know, when you pull up a floor panel, you find five other problems, right? Same thing happens in schools. As I said before, the best thing that you can do in any given situation is the right thing. The worst thing is the wrong thing. I'm sorry, the next best thing is the wrong thing. And the worst thing you can do is nothing at all. GFW has not been able to do anything because we haven't had the financial resources in order to do that. So we haven't been able to do much, we do a little bit, but been doing next to nothing. And that's the worst decision we can make. 
Last spring, we shared these guiding principles in regards to our facilities. Our priority is to keep students safe and our staff safe. We need to exceed area schools by providing 21st century programming that students deserve. And we do have great programming at our schools and our teachers do an amazing job with it. And we need to maintain our buildings as best we can while we prepare for the eventual transition to a pre-K-12 building in one or more phases. These were our guiding principles. Minnesota school state statute has two different types of uh, funding that you can do. One is a voter approved, which is an operating levy, which you've seen tonight, school bonds, which you saw tonight, and capital project levies. School boards also have approval, approval to increase taxes for capital facility bonds, equipment certificates, LTFM, lease purchase financing, lease levy, and abatement bonds. <coughs> If you've recently received your tax statement and taken a look at it, you'll notice that there was an increase from the school district. That is a result of a school board approved tax increase. And that's why that went up. After working with our financial consultants and looking at our assessment, GFW has the ability to approve up to $43 million in a capital improvement plan. This is still short of the 50.1 that we need. And this is also categorical funding, meaning that we would only be able to use it on certain projects. So in addition to this, we still need to go out to the public and ask them for additional funds. And our buildings will still be old. And we're still going to have to do this again in 15 years or so. Because HVAC equipment, roofs, all that stuff needs repair, right? If the school board were to approve a capital improvement plan, I would recommend the following timeline. We currently are doing asbestos abatement, taking out flooring, getting that out of there, getting a new carpet and tiles, and we complete those projects through the summer. The business center and gym indoor air quality projects, I would suggest doing in 2024, and we would be completing the rest of the capital improvement projects over 25, 26, 27, and 28. I would also recommend to the board, if you do choose this option, that we would suspend any work if a facility project question is approved by the community. But until that happens, we have an obligation to keep our students safe, and we have to consider the, the tools that we have given by state statute to make that happen. This is the resolution passed on July 18th, 2022, which said we'll be working towards a single campus site. I think this is a really hard thing. This is hard for our community. This is hard for our board. And I think our school board needs support and our community needs support in going through that process. So I would encourage our board to work with Teamworks, who we've done some work with before, to help our board work through these things. We have three new board members who will be starting and helping them to work as a board and as a team to move our district forward. They support board development, and also they can help us with uh, community engagement on the capital improvement plan or any type of facil potential facilities question. I also think it's important that I, as a superintendent, go out in the public and answer questions and be available. People will have questions, and they'll look for accurate information. I think working with the legislature is really important. There's a $17.6 billion surplus this year. What can we do to support not just our school, but other schools who are struggling with LTFM. What can we do to increase tax breaks for our farmers through increasing that egg to school credit? We saw it at 85%. It was introduced at 100, which would be amazing. Uh, 85 is still really good. So let's get that going. Let's work with our legislators and let's make some things happen. In my conversations already with legislators, this is something that they are focused on increasing. So I have three options for consideration for, for the board. One is you pass a capital improvement plan going into effect immediately. This would address some needs at our current facilities. It won't fix everything though. We work with Teamworks for board, with board development and community engagement throughout this process. And you can do this through a school board vote tonight. Question two is to ask the community. Or option two is to ask the community. Question one would be a $55 million new 712 facility. Some folks have said, 
They're worried about the future enrollment numbers. They're worried about price. We saw a little bit of that, a little bit in the survey. Um, and what if we do consolidate down the road? Well, this can be the building that everybody goes to if you consolidate and you can do an elementary in different areas. However, I will note that when we did our assessments, a two-section elementary school is gonna run you probably 35 plus million. So you're gonna need a couple of those. So that takes you to 70 million. And if you put this on top of it, you're up to 120 some million dollars. I don't know where exactly how many people live where, but if you divide that in half, you're almost at the price of a new pre-K-12, which also could, if there's a consolidation, be the school for everybody. In this build, there would be an option to bolt on more classrooms if needed. It will be built for that. So if you ever do have that, where there's a consolidation, you can do that. If the 712 is what's chosen by the public and enrollment does decline, you could eventually move into that site and you've got your right size build. So it does offer an option to both, you know, potential down the road for how enrollment might play out and also how different district decisions could play out, even though that there's no um, direction from our board to do that or any of the other school boards. If we move into a pre-K-12 facility, though, we can give the board, we can go to the public and say, we will reduce the operating levy and reduce the cost. So we can reduce the tax impact by reducing our operating levy. So even though you approve a facility, we can reduce the operating one that you passed a couple of years ago and pass that money back to our taxpayers. Teamworks would still support us in board development and community engagement around this process. This requires voter approval. I would recommend if the board does choose this option that you also pass a capital improvement plan because if it doesn't pass, we need to keep our kids safe. We need to keep our staff safe. And so I'd recommend passing the capital improvement plan parallel to this. And if the voters did approve this, then we don't have to take that step. And we could wait until November to make that happen. I think it's important that the public knows that we're serious about doing that and not just say it. So if you do choose this, I would encourage the board to put on the ballot the operating levy so they can see that and know that we've called for an election to reduce their taxes. We would go from 1406 of people to 996. That's a reduction of $410. We can do that and maintain all of our programming. I talked about the 750,000 earlier. We didn't have the level of programming a few years ago that we do today that our community and our students just love. We can maintain all that and we can still pass money back to our taxpayers through a reduction of the operating levy. I would propose that we that we put two, uh, go out for two elections, one in April and one in November, and you approve both tonight. The April one would ask for a facility question for a, pre, a 712 and a pre-K-12. You would need to vote yes on the 712 to then approve the extra 14.9 million to turn into a pre-K-12. So it'd be a yes, yes. Also tonight, you would put on the ballot call for a November election, which would be a reduction in the operating levy. The reason why to go out in April is that you could be into a new facility by 2025, the fall of 2025. That would reduce potential future construction costs. It gets us into the building sooner. Um, the November election we need to call because we need to show the public we're serious about reducing the operating levy, but we can only reduce it if we're in a pre-K-12. A 712 will not get us an operating levy reduction. Also, you can keep those same questions on the ballot. And I would recommend putting it on both. If it ends up pass, if the 712 passes, then it's just a pre-K-12 operating levy reduction in November. If both pass, then just the operating levy on there to reduce. But if we wait till November, we cannot get in until fall of 2026. So there'd be an extra year there of costs. So what does this look like? My whole graph isn't showing up, so I want to make sure I'm going to escape real quick and show it this way and I'll jump back in. So we used a $200,000 house because we think that encompasses a lot of houses. That's higher than the, the county average in the area. On a $43 million capital improvement plan, the annual impact would be $167 increase per year. Portions of it would be covered by the aid to school, uh, aid to school credit. A few spots would not. The assessed value currently 
in our area is seventy uh, seven thousand five hundred dollars. That's what you pay property taxes on. The annual impact would be a dollar four on homesteaded. On non homesteaded, be two dollars and eight cents. That's the forty three million dollar capital improvement plan. The board has the authority to vote on tonight. The fifty million, the fifty five million dollar central question, seven twelve facility would be an impact of $134 on a $200,000 house, 84 cents for a farmer per acre on a homesteaded and $1.68 on the other. The pre-K-12 is 60, would be $67 because we'd be revoking the operating levy. So you can move into a pre-K-12 and only have an increase of $67 a year, which is about $5 a month on a $200,000 house. So it'd be $5 a month on a $200,000 house for a new pre-K-12 if we revoke the operating levy. The impact on homesteaded land, $1.11 an acre, and two twenty-three dollars an acre for non-homesteaded. Now I talked about that egg to school credit going up to 85%. And I think it's important that I represent that right now because that is a real thing. That was in the final package between the two bodies. Both the House and the Senate agreed on that. One was led by Republicans, one was led by Democrats. There is a lot of bipartisan support, but the total package was part of an ominous bill. So it nothing happened, right? And the government hung on to all the money. Well, that's probably coming back. And that's, I think should be part of our legislative platform, which maybe we can talk about our next school board meeting. If it gets up to 85%, that'll kick in. So even if you approve it in April, this still kicks in and you're still good to go. So whenever it were to kick in and happen, you get that. When the law went into place, people that had current facility projects in place got the egg to school credit. This would bring you down to 56 cents an acre for homesteaded and non-homesteaded would be at a dollar eleven. So it kind of cuts it in half by getting that extra 15%. So I think we need to really make that a focus. If you were to do that tonight, you would have four approvals. One would be a capital improvement plan resolution. Two would be the LTFM resolution. Three would be to call for an April election and then also call for a November election. And you have those documents with you tonight. Option three is you delay the ballot question. The new board of warper team works for board development and develop the questions. You pass the capital improvement plan tonight, along with the LTFM plan. And that would go into effect by November if our new board can't figure out a solution. We don't have much time to wait before we may run into some potential safety issues. So we have to be thinking about something. This would require uh, voter approval to put a question on. But again, the capital improvement plan does not. I want to thank you for your time, <clears throat> members of the public, those in the audience. I want to thank you for your time. Um, I do have some folks here that want to share some input on this. So I'm going to step away right now and um, allow for that to happen. And um, let's see, so I'm going to turn the video on here. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Horton. Members of the board, and for those of you who may not know who I am, I'm Julie Elmer, the executive assistant to Dr. Horton and a Fairfax community member, landowner. My children went to school here, graduated from here. And I just wanted to touch on a couple things for me personally. I've This is my 27th year in this school district. I love this school district. Uh, we've been working on this building and talked about this building issues for four superintendents. I think now is the time to act. My recommendation would be a pre-K-12 building. I think that's what would be best for our students. 
thanks for listening to me. That would be my recommendation. I also have had other members of the community send me letters <clears throat> that they would like me to read for you because they could not be here tonight. This is from Jenny O'Connor and Greg Olson. Jenny O'Connor is a Winthrop City Council member and Greg is a Gibbon City Council member. And it says, as a longtime community members and recently elected, this is Jenny was recently elected to the Winthrop and Greg has been on the Gibbon City Council for a while. Um, they want to share that they support GFW public schools. We believe that it's in the best interest to support a centrally located pre-K 12 school. It would only cost $5 per month for a 200K house. I, we also understand that if the community does not approve it, the board must do what needs to be done to keep the staff and students safe with the capital improvement plan but the pre-K-12 just makes sense. This is from Lisa Schwecki. It says, I am, good evening board members. I am sorry I'm unable to attend the meeting. I'm the secretary of the elementary, parent of three former GFW graduates, and a community member. I am privileged to work with such great staff and students. I am in support of one new school for the GFW students. The elementary students love it when the football players and bas basketball players come to spend time with our younger students. I do realize that comes at a big price tag. If that is not a possibility, I would support a, the school board making the choice for a safe learning environment for the staff and students. I am truly blessed to be a GFW employee and community member of this district. The community of GFW provides our seniors with so many scholarships, provides gifts through the spirit of the season and helps with the back, back the pack program. So children have meals provided over the weekends. I know we can all pull together for the students of GFW community. Thank you for your time and consideration. This one is from Anita Weir Wenninger. GFW schools has been a part of our community for 30 years. This includes students ECFE through 12th grade. This makes up siblings, parents, grandparents, GFW is, is in our communities, town and country. GFW needs to support, needs the support in the building a school. Many families are part of our communities. Let's join our school community. Many GFW students and families serve as EMTs and ambulance crews, church communities, and summer festivals and recreational committees, American Legion, Lions, and more. Stand proudly for GFW families and students, making a safe environment and standing proud full circle. Thank you for your time. And thank you so much for what you guys do. It isn't an easy job and there's a lot more to come, but thank you so much. I'm going to get into the Elmer. I had to type mine up so that I um, don't forget what I wanted to say. So my name is Tanya Shiro, and I'm the director of student and community programs here at GFW. I have worked for GFW for 23 years. I do not live in this district, but this is truly where my heart is. My husband graduated from GFW in 1993, and we still have family that lives in this community. I had the privilege, I don't know if I should say that out loud, of dating my husband while we were in high school. And I had the opportunity to be a part of his high school experiences here at GFW. 
I was always jealous of the relationships he formed here and the sense of pride and excitement he had in being a T-bird. In fact, he still has that pride. He still displays his DFW football helmet, and not too long ago, he actually pulled out his letterman's jacket to show it off to his friends. He still tells his stories and talks so highly of the experiences and friendships he had at GFW. GFW is a special place, and until you experience it firsthand, you may not realize that. The current and future children and families in this district deserve to experience what an amazing place GFW is and will continue to be with the support of our community. As you are aware, our facility needs here at GFW have been an ongoing issue for many years. This is not a topic that has been has just been brought to our attention, but it's time to do something about it. Personally, I feel that that's a pre-K-12 building like we've talked about centrally located. I can understand firsthand because my husband's a school board member in the community we live in how challenging and rewarding your job as a school board member is. And I appreciate all the time that you guys put into everything you do for our district. As a school board member, you are responsible for doing what is in the best interest of the school you're serving. You are not here to make the best decision for you, your friends, or the town you live in, but you're here to make the best decision for the students and families that our district serves. Our students deserve to have a school that is safe for them to attend and where they're able to become future world-class leaders. <clears throat> All right. Hello, school board, community members, staff members, and members of the press. My name is Brittany Galetka, and I have the privilege of serving as the uh, middle school and high school principal. As an educator, we teach our students to have a growth mindset. We encourage our students to try, try, and try again, and we correct them when they say they cannot do something. We simply say, you might not be able to do it yet. Since I've been in the district, I've had the privilege of guiding our school programming through the growth and change to become competitive with our neighboring schools. We are even exceeding many other neighboring schools in many ways. Our additional academic programming, programming such as CTE offerings, college now classes, academies, and a true middle school model are all truly impressive. And in the areas of athletics, activities, our scholarship opportunities that many of our students take part in, and many other ways, we exceed with school spirit and the essence of the GFW community. However, we have not seen this growth within our facilities. I believe the GFW school district needs to change our mindset from we can't or we shouldn't to yes, we can, and then and we need to take action now. Tonight, I encourage the members of our school board to take action on getting another step closer to the school our students and staff deserve to have. I encourage you to take action with the pre-K-12 option. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Jennifer Thompson, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I've lived in the GFW community for 28 years, and I'm a parent of a current GFW student and have two children who are graduates of GFW. We love GFW. I'm also the GFW elementary principal. As a resident and a parent and employee of GFW schools, I wanna encourage the board to move forward with a pre-K through 12 building centrally located. The tax impact is minimal. GFW is out of statutory operating debt and has many new programs in place. The future for our students and school is bright. After much division and discord over this issue through the years, now is the time to come together. We do not have to continue to be divided. We can and should move forward to address the facilities issue for the safety and security of our staff and students. Now is the time to do something that will positively impact our children and the GFW communities for years to come. Now is the time to act. A pre-K through 12 building centrally located makes sense. Please let's get it done. And thank you so much for all that you do. Well, school board, my name is Brian Weir. I'm the director of facilities, buildings and grounds. Um, I'm a former graduate of GFW school and uh, the second graduating class in 1989. Uh, my wife, and we heard it from a letter before, she's also a former graduate. We have a son that's a freshman this year, and 
if you'd asked me when I graduated if I'd be back at GFW working, there would have been no chance in hell. Excuse my language on that. But I've been here now almost 10 years. And all the 10 years that I've been here, it's been wonderful. It's great to see the kids every day, just to see the bright smiles that they have. And also now the new programming that we're offering is wonderful. And on my aspect, my hands are tied a lot of times of what we can do and what we can't do from the Minnesota Department of Education on what we can fix at certain times. So my, my recommendation would be a pre-K through 12th grade centrally located. Thank you. High school board community. I'm Josh Wasman, student services coordinator. Uh, I'm newer to GFW. This is my second year here. Um, but since taking this position, I've done as much as I can to be part of this community. I've tried to write this numerous times, and I think the biggest takeaway is the worst thing to do is nothing. The bottom line is cost. Cost to taxpayers, cost to the district to run two buildings, okay, and cost of doing nothing. My opinion is a pre-K through 12 building. Evening school board members, Wade Werner, Director of Technology and Online Learning with GFW Schools. I, I really enjoy seeing all the faces here tonight, being part of this discussion. One thing that uh, jumps out at me right away when we're talking about this is how fortunate many of us are to call GFW home. 22 years ago, 22 years ago, I... Uh, I graduated from college and I was told that there's a possibility, it's probably only a one-year position, uh, but there's a possibility that we could get you in as an elementary computer teacher for the GFW school district. Keep in mind that it's probably for only one year. And 22 years later, with a home that my family truly loves and two children that have graduated from the GFW system later, in numerous, numerous life memories, um, I can tell you that it's an embarrassment of blessings how fortunate we are to be a part of the GFW schools community. Uh, working as the director of technology, it's I, I took over for somebody who I hold very near and dear to me. His name's Ron Swamberg. And for those of you that know Ron, who's probably watching right now at home, uh, Ron was a very important piece of the GFW school district from its conception. And the things that Ron did in the school district, he set the bar very high for the things that we were doing as a school. And he received uh, both state and national recognition for the accomplishments that he has done. And working with technology, we all know that technology is, uh, it can be a blessing and a curse, but the technology that we're working with here at GFW is something that we can be very proud of. Um, we are doing some unbelievable things with the students, and that's something that we plan to do uh, for many years to come, and we plan on adapting and learning and, and accepting those challenges and not playing the victim, but being aggressive with how how can we better serve our students? Because these students, which used to be T-ballers or used to be elementary students of ours, are the students, are the people in our communities right now. We have people in our communities, uh, alumni, that are the ones coming to our homes and fixing our furnaces. They are here at school helping uh, as part of the staff. They are um, electricians. They are doctors. Uh, I can speak firsthand. Uh, Went, had some anesthesia for a knee surgery that I had. And behind the curtain, I heard, uh, Mr. Warner? And my anesthesiologist <laughs> was a former uh, little that I had worked with. So uh, we can be very proud of what we're doing here at the school district. And I refuse to give nothing but my best. And I know that the staff feels, feels the exact same way. 
um, because we see a very bright future, very, very bright future for GFW schools. And I, I can envision, I can envision a pre-K-12 building centrally located that we can all call ours and something that we can take pride in and be very proud of. So thank you, board, for your time. You have a very challenging job, but a very rewarding job as well. So thank you for your time. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Danny Bruins, uh, Director of Health Services. So I too am new here. This is my second year at GFW. And in my short time here, I've seen how the changes have been imp implemented have uh, positively affected our students here at GFW. There's just one piece that is missing. It is this new facility to help support the new opportunities for both current and future students. The time is now for a new pre-K pre through 12, centrally located for our students and our staff members. Thank you. My name is Lane Tandy, and uh, I'm the reading interventionist at GFW. And this is my second year here in the community. And I really count it a blessing to be part of this community. I might live in New Ulm at this point, but I tell you what, uh, having spent a year and a half here with T-Birds, I grew up in a tiny little town, 900 people in Montana. And I, I moved to get that rural experience again because I felt like I was missing something and my kids were missing something. And I was right. Um, it's a vibrant agricultural community that you have here. The kids are great. And working with them on a daily basis reminds me why I do what I do. It's not the big bucks that I'm after. I know that's a surprise as a teacher. Um, I do it because there is value in every child that I teach. And I see their potential. I see their growth. And I would urge you to make this decision for a pre-K to uh, 12th grade because the, your kids are worth it. They are absolutely worth it. The facility is falling down. It's, it's, it's at a point. It's, this is a, 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 a moment where we really need to act. And it doesn't make sense to throw money at something that you know you're going to have to throw money at again in just a couple of years just to keep you know it from crumbling um this community i think would make the right decision if it chose to build thank you Good evening. I'm Melissa Larrabee. Um, I am one of the social emotional learning interventionists here at the elementary school. I too am fairly new to the community. We moved here in 2020 at the height of the pandemic. My children started school here that year. I was at that time working in St. Paul running Head Start centers. As a teacher and administrator, I was incredibly impressed with this district, watching my children grow and thrive here. As soon as I decided I needed to discontinue that long drive to St. Paul, GFW was the first place I chose to look. And I am thrilled that I was able to take this position and begin to work in this community and support where I call home. Um, a little background that relates to this. I'm actually from Mora, Minnesota. Some people in this community have heard of Mora. A former principal, Ralph Fairchild, happened to be my sixth grade teacher when I grew up in Mora. Um, and at that time, we were in what was a solution for Mora Public Schools. We had aging facilities, just like we do here. Um, one hallway was the hallway where my mom once locked a teacher out and threw a desk on a roof or some absurd story she told me. But the point is that building had been there since the 30s, mid 20s, I believe. And they chose at that time to build an extra level on the high school, fourth through through sixth grade was on that level. And 
the building problems did not disappear. They continued, they came back. When I was graduating, the building was falling down even further. There was flooding, there was mold that continued on. They decided the elementary school could not be built onto. It was landlocked. All of those children went to the middle school facility that had been another solution they attempted. Recently, Mora finally passed after seven attempts. They are looking at a new facility in 20, 2023, I believe, is when they're opening that new facility. It took seven attempts, but a solid 25 years of debate back and forth before that happened. And hundreds of children went through that school. All of my nieces and nephews who talked about the building getting worse and worse every year. The voters in Mora absolutely cared about the school. They cared about the children. I know they did for a fact. Much like GFW, I grew up in a town that was proud, a community that loved its school. I see that same vibe here. It's why I'm proud to live here, why I know this is where my children children will thrive and grow. Um, oh, lost my little spot there. I'm sorry. It's evident that our schools matter. Every event I attend, it's packed. The recent elementary concert, if you weren't here, it was standing room only. That shows me that this community loves the school. They love the children. I hear of money, supplies, time, and gifts being provided for scholarships, spirit of the season, and other programs that benefit our residents directly. Small towns demonstrate an unmatched level of pride. I was raised on a farm by a semi-driver, brothers that were milk truck drivers, fuel truck drivers, and semi-drivers. And in that upbringing, I was taught to be very proud of what is my own, proud of what I have. I urge us all in this community, our school board, our voters to come together and be proud of what we have. Take care of what is ours to ensure a future for our children. Inside of these school buildings, children are learning lessons of reconciliation and problem solving. Feedback from community members and staff show that those are skills we want them to have. In the social emotional learning class each week, I work with students to help them unify and cooperate for a better future. We practice ways to solve disagreements on the playground or in the classroom through conversations, expressions of feelings, and even games like rock, paper, scissors. Well, I know it's certainly not that simple in the adult world, especially when we are talking about issues like tax impacts and bonds, we can still come together to discuss difficult topics. These are heavy decisions that we cannot take lightly, but we have a duty to show the students that we looked at all the data, we made informed decisions that will improve learning conditions and maintain safety. For our staff, these buildings are more than just a building. This is where we spend most of our life, where we put our heart and soul. We were built to do this and we care about the children to our very core. We think constantly about how to improve our practice and reach students in a different way we worry about their safety and well being. We share creative discourse that often challenges us and asks us to be vulnerable and grow together. While I shared about my family and my hometown a bit, all of which are precious to me in ways that I can't even begin to explain, my parents have both passed and we've all grown into our own families. So I know that my future doesn't lie in any of the places of my past. My future lies here at GFW. I believe in GFW and the people of these three strong and proud communities. I believe we can come together to make difficult decisions and take care of what is ours. And as I wrap up, as I was getting ready tonight, my seven-year-old who attends this school said, mom, what are you talking about tonight? And I told her what this meeting was about briefly. And she said, oh good, we need a new building mama. And I said, are you just listening to me and dad talk? And she said, no. I see it in our building every day. I see walls that are falling apart. I see things that are falling off and caving in, Mom. And I just want us to be safe. So from the mouths of babes, I ask you to please consider this vote. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for members of the board for um having some staff and some of our cabinet members share information with you. Um, 
obviously you have some tough choices to make and I just wanted you to have as much information perspective as you can from our staff members as we uh, go through that process. So um, we have three options for consideration. Uh, option one, which was to pass the capital improvement plan. And it also include passing the LTFM plan, which would go into effect immediately. Option two was to do that, but also add the, the um, going out for a question in April and November. Um, and if the public can't get behind one of those projects, then we'll, we have the capital improvement plan to fall back on to keep our students and staff safe. The third would be to delay a decision, um, but also for the new board to figure out, but also pass the capital improvement plan tonight. Um, so that would go into effect in December or November if uh, the new board wasn't able to come to some type of decision for the community to support um, or the community did not support that question. So um, I'm happy to take any questions or just allow you to. Um... Yeah, Jeff, I, I have a question. So since the buildings are in poor condition and we see what's happened in Fairfax now, um, demolition costs, was there no inclusion? The last time we went through this, there was that was included because it'll fall back on the city eventually. So I'm just kind of wondering, it should be available within the option because unless we have a plan for everything, we'll just have a crumbling building in each town. So just something I'd like to have the community have a little input on before we get too far because we you know, there's more costs involved in the future if we do decide to do something like this. You know, and then also this past summer, I asked the uh, city of Gibbon to assure us that they could pay for all infrastructure needs that would be necessary, but I've never received, no one has verification that who would be paying for those street upgrades and all that other stuff. So. I think there's just a few costs that are just not completely in here, you know, and I think that rushing it at the end of the year is probably not looking good to the taxpayers, especially when they voted upon three new board members, you know, just who will be on in a few weeks. And I feel they'll make just as informed decisions as us. And I feel like it's kind of a rushed fact when there is some increased costs that could fall in these communities that are not being addressed at all. So I can I can definitely um, address some of your questions and that's for the board to deliberate kind of the speed in which you want to to move. Um, the in terms of the use of facilities, um, I know there has been conversations and I am not I am not someone who can speak for the cities on how they could potentially use those facilities, but I will share that there has been conversation about how um, buildings um, not just in not just in New Ulm, but in other districts that have been part of have transformed when partnering with the city and getting investors in that. And, and we have a housing shortage here. I know that's a, that's a thing that people have talked about. And could those be done? Different types of funds can be utilized for that. So I think you're right that we should talk with our cities. We should talk about how they want to do that and how they want to handle those properties. I don't think it has to be demolition, but I think there's there's a conversation there. And I would welcome that um, ha and have been open to that with our cities. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, um, we have Krauss Anderson here. Um, Gary Benson from Krauss Anderson. Can you talk maybe a little bit about how that works in a building project um, with, uh, you know, connecting up to the facility? Uh, in, in terms of at the existing facility or, or are you talking about the initial question was about demolition. Um, just in terms of like connecting the building. Oh. I didn't hear you. Uh, just in terms of connecting to a building. So like if we put a, if we were to put a building across the street from here, just as an example, how do you get the structure? Well, yeah, we can certainly do that. Um, if you've got the land for it or can acquire the land. <clears throat> is that is that included in the in the price or is that is that an extra cost? Well, it, it's it's not I don't think we have that one of the options, do we? Adding on. 
The question is, does think, built up, uh, there's a pipe that comes out right across the street. So um, this lit cell is not here. So let's say we built it right across from the highway. We have municipal hookup in two different locations here in Gibbon, if that's where it went. So basically we'd have to run something across the street to the building. Oh yeah, I get it. You're talking about utility services. Yep. Yes. We are assuming that in the in the budgeting, yes. So the sixteen sixteen nine nine or the fifty five million would handle that. Yes. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. No, what I want to source. Will it work now? Um, what I meant by the question was, uh, so the, the all of the students being in one town as my observation that it will require another 1.5 million in uh, wastewater handling according to the state guidelines. So I was just wondering who pays for that. And the water tower is over a hundred years old. If we require more water than they can handle, who, who pays for that too? Just some ob observations and how much does that cost? So. so, so. Sounds I like city, that question. city uh, questions. City Administrator Litzau addressed that in an email to us earlier and said that the city of Gibbon does have the infrastructure to support. So that would, they have, they have it and it could handle the new school. One thing you have to remember too is that in building a, you're not bringing over, you're bringing over one site. So whether this state site stays online and you build a new one, or if you were to shut this one down and build a new one, there's infrastructure in place. And she has confirmed that with engineers. And she did send us an email because that question came up this spring and she did answer that. So they do have the infrastructure to handle a new facility. Well, I guess I'd like to address the notion that this is rushed. I've been on the school board under five different superintendents. We've been talking about this for well nigh 10 years and it's not rushed. We've been talking about it. We've kicked the can down the road. We've had votes. We've talked about it some more. We kicked the can down the road. The time has finally come. We need to address our facilities and safety concerns and make sure that we can keep our students and our staff safe. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to address the fellow board members and the community. Um, I prepared a statement for tonight, um, kind of regarding my time on the board and the decision tonight. I've done a lot of reflecting over the past five weeks or so, um, the five or so weeks about my time on the board these past two years. Um, and boy, have we been through a lot, as you can all attest. We've gone from being an SOD, making unpopular but unfortunately necessary decisions by fighting budget constraints to where we are today, a statewide and nationally recognized school district because of what we've accomplished. How many schools can do this after what we've gone through? We've added hundreds of opportunities for our students, which I personally heard the appreciation from parents and students for these additions. We're out of SOD and our fund balance is strong. We just have a final piece of the puzzle to add. Our students, staff, and community deserve a building they are proud of. Over the last two years, I have personally spent hours and hours listening, learning, and discussing our school with Superintendent Horton, CFO Heine, other board members, principals, field experts, cabinet members, and community members. I've spent hours in schools, on buses, with students and teachers, touring and listening to their wants and needs. During these discussions, we've disagreed, overcome challenges, and have come together in unity. Our community has been facing challenges for over three decades. We are continuously feuding over truth. Unfortunately, we have a group among us who are anti-tax and anti-GFW. Some of you may or may not know that there's a strategy out there to sabotage bond referendums for schools. These people use specific consistent tactics to try and accomplish their goal. Here are just a few examples of some of their tactics. Using declining enrollment as an issue not to vote on a border bond referendum and will skew the numbers. 
They use expense per pupil as an issue and will skew information on construction costs. Last week, Member Merkel prepared a statement. His statement spoke of enrollment, construction costs, and consolidation. During his statement, he reported that our fall of 2022 enrollment was 598 pupils and had concerns that the community had been given false information during the most recent survey that was sent out. He failed to explain to you that the numbers he reported were from the MDE's compensatory revenue report. This count only reports students who generate compensatory aid. It is not a report of current enrollment, nor is it a report of a school's average daily membership or ADM. Our actual numbers, as Mr. Horton uh, reported tonight, are currently um, 615 students in K through 12 and 677 students, students in pre-K through 12 as of today. Looking back at this time last year, pre-K through 12 was 689 students and 714 students in pre-K through 12. I'm sorry, 714 students in May of 2022. We are currently on track to have over 700 pre-K through 12 students in, the May of, in May of 2023. Our most recent survey reported our school's average 700 students. These, accu these are accurate numbers are consistent with the survey. I also did some research after member Merkel reported the Riverbend education was able to find roofing updates for around $3 a square foot. Even our construction experts were impressed by this price. He also reported that Riverbend's building was comparable to size of GFW's primary site here in Gibbon. I found out that Riverbend's building is 23,599 square feet and GFW's primary site is approximately 67,000 square feet. That is a difference um, that is over doubled. Riverbend acquired two quotes during the year and found that the second quote later in the year had increased. This is one example of current inflation and that prices are not becoming favorable. As for the price, the lower quote was for $12.56 per square foot, more than three times what member Merkel reported. Our community is angry, confused, and have issues with trust, and I don't blame them. We have a current, we have a board member who is reporting information that isn't accurate and not consistent with the correct information provided. Policy 209, Code of Ethics, Section 2, Number 5 reads, each board member shall follow the code of ethics stated in this policy. Support the decision of the school board, even if my position concerning the issue was different. Member Merkel, you are in violation of school policy. We approved a resolution on July 18th, 2022 to work towards a centrally located pre-K-12 building. You also made a motion which passed in March of 2021 to not work towards consolidation, yet you continue to push your inaccurate information. I, I didn't say I wanted to. I am still reading my statement. You continue to push your inaccurate information and push against our resolutions and motions. A recent statement from an MSBA staff member said there's absolutely no reason for a district of your size to consolidate. I'm frustrated and so is our community. I remember how challenging it was as a new board member. It was difficult to balance learning what it meant to be a good board member, go through the trainings, get caught up on all the information, and yet we must make tough decisions. Therefore, I support option two and asking our community for a new pre-K through 12 building. This decision will support GFW's future board. They can focus on the work at hand and not the decision itself. Our students, teachers, and communities have waited long enough for a building they can be proud of and a, and a building they can say, hey, you see that school right there? That's my school. I would like to leave everyone with one final thought and challenge. I've recently seen a comment on social media telling our community to wake up and not support our schools. They were right in the mindset that our community needs to wake up. They do, they need to wake up and stand up to those saying no for no other reason than just to say no. Come together as a GFW strong group, do not accept inaccurate information and do not accept these anti-tax and shout anti-tax tactics and shout your GFW pride from the rooftops. Our kids deserve better. Um, can I ask a quick clarifying question? What did you say our square footage was for Gibbon Elementary? Uh, 23,000. I'm sorry, Gibbon. You had 67 in your presentation. Um, to clarify a point, I, I wasn't meaning that it was this certain square feet. 
I was just saying, I was just wondering if there was another option of getting a cheaper bid. That's all I meant by it. I didn't mean to state an infactual amount. I was just looking for clarification on could we find a cheaper bid? It was nothing to do with trying to compare <clears throat> apples to apples. And the other thing too with uh, with enrollment, I just have asked you for a long time the actual numbers and I, I haven't got them and you told me to keep going to the MDE site. So I don't know. And that this, now that I know, I'm happy. It's good that we have a good enrollment. I just have never known what it was and I've been trying to figure it out. <laughs> Not a big deal, you know. I want our school to last a long time too. That's why I'm here. Actually, it is a big deal yeah. when you bring up that information in front of a group and you got I just had I just I just had one piece of paper that I got from the MDE and and now it's been clarified. And I agree, it's fine. You know, it, as if we have more than 650, that's great. I just now I know. <laughs> and and I apologize to everyone if it was incorrect what I said, but that's the only number I I had seen at the time. So and I apologize if it came out as that point, but I was just trying to clarify so I would know how many kids were in school. Not a big deal. I I definitely don't want to have that conversation right now, but I want to clarify that I don't feel like it's correct that you haven't been given access to information. So um, we can talk about that later if you want it. But um, and if there is information you need, I'd, I'd welcome you to meet with me, like many of our board members do, to to get information. So it's an open invitation and. Um, Please let me know, but um, I, I don't feel like that's that part is correct. Okay. okay. I was going to prepare a statement for tonight, but every time I tried to sit down and prepare it, I just couldn't find the right words to explain my thoughts. I've been on the school board for four years. To say that it's been easy to sit on the GFW school board is a complete understatement. You know, it was my dream to be on the school board. I couldn't wait to make a difference to support our kids. But being on the school board is hard. It's probably the hardest job I've ever had in my life. I couldn't believe that nobody ran against me from Fairfax. Now I completely understand why no one from Fairfax wants to be on the GFW school board. Because it is lonely up here. And people are not nice to you. And it is difficult. So four years ago, I voted and I got on the board. I voted no for one building. I've regretted that ever since. Um, now I have, you know, all the experience of four years. I've taken in all the information. And, you know, I had a big decision this weekend. What, what was I going to vote for? What was I going to do? My husband is from Fairfax, graduated in 1998. And one thing that he said to me this weekend that has just stuck with me, he says, you know, Marissa, it's easy to just do nothing and continue to fail. But it's a lot harder to actually try and succeed. So that is what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to quit being scared of our communities. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to vote for what I believe in. Um, I believe that we need one centrally located school in Gibbon. It's very hard living in Fairfax, always going to Winthrop. That frustrates me to the core how much everything is in Winthrop. And it's just really frustrating because I do think Fairfax gets forgotten about. Um, and as a board, we're tasked with the decision, what are we going to do? We have to take care of the kids. It's our job to figure out what to do with the buildings. So tonight, my vote will reflect what I feel is best for the kids, the future of the community, and the future of the district. And I'm not going to be scared anymore. So that's all I have to say tonight. If I open it up, it would say pretty much what everybody in this whole room has all said. Um, I can't even go back and say how many years I've been on it because I don't even know how many years I've been on it. But I did graduate from the school 32 years ago, which is a long time. Seen a lot of kids go through it. I'm not gonna say I ever wanted to be on the board. I got talked into being on the board. I enjoyed it in the beginning, but 
I'll honestly say, going through exactly what they said, it is a tough job and thankless. But if you're sitting in this position, you look at the right thing to do. You just got to make the decision. So many people battling over the one school thing. I mean, we joined these schools together way back in the beginning. I was one of the first classes. We got along better then than we do now, which is terrible to think that 32 years can do that. Um, I don't even know what to say with that part of it. I mean, it, it's, it's a shame that three towns all together can't take something good and do it financially or not i mean i don't care if it's a buck an acre or five bucks an acre for a farmer if you can't build what somebody built for you years ago and believe me 50 years ago 80 years ago it was hard to build it then there's something wrong i got grandkids that are going to be in this school one day i sure as heck don't want to send them out of this district I got no reason to go to Hutch, to go to New Orleans, or go anyplace else. And to watch these towns just disappear if you take the district out of it is even worse yet. You can look to the north and see what happened on 212. It's not pretty. So I'll vote probably the same way as a few others on this board but i'm i'm not afraid of doing it either i said on i know i'll make a lot of enemies doing this but if that's the way it is that's the way it is and i won't ever take back whatever i do on it so it's about all i got to say i guess we've heard for everybody but me um yeah, echoing a lot of the comments that I heard tonight from Mr. Dr. Horton, from the staff, from another board members. Graduated in 1978. I have kids in JFW now. I have grandkids in JFW now. Need to have this school around long term. And we've been procrastinating or trying to convince people for an extended period of time we need to spend some money. If we could have done this four or five years ago, we would have spent considerably less and got considerably more. And the longer we wait, the further we kick the can down the road, the project is never going to get any cheaper. It's never going to be a perfect project. There's always going to be hiccups. But I believe that option two, as presented, not only shows the taxpayers and the parents and the students of the district that were serious about working on the facility question. It also gives guidance to the three new board members that are coming on that there's a lot of institutional knowledge leaving the board this year. You've got three members getting either voted off or retiring. And I believe that giving them the framework, making the hard decision tonight is probably in their best interest. They can certainly tweak it and do whatever they think needs to be done, but at least they have a framework to work for and a goal to work towards. And then it's back to the, the voters and taxpayers of the district. If they decide in April or November not to do it, okay, then we've got plan C in place that we are going to spend some money to at least keep our building safe and functional for a period of time. It's going to be expensive. It may not be the best option, but at least it's an option. We're going to be doing something that we're not going to be accused of kicking the can further down the road. So I will make a motion to approve option number two. Is there a second? I'll second it. Motion's made and second to approve option number two. Um, any further discussion? Just uh, add, if, if motion two is um, approved, then we would have four other actions that would need to go with it. The capital improvement plan, the long-term facility plan, the um, 
<coughs> call for election in April and call for election. So we just have a few more procedural things to do with that. Well, and we have to approve option two first. We, you can, I already did. You can you can do that, or you could just approve the. Um, I mean, you've made the motion now, so I, I would probably suggest voting on that, and then go ahead and and then do the resolutions, if that's what passes. All right. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, raise your hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries four to two. Ms. Four to one. Uh, Miss Elmer, do you have the documents for Chair Keen? I do. Thank you. It would be capital improvement plan, then long-term facility plan, then April, then November. Mr. Elias, looking for a second. Just want to make sure that Bill's going to go on. So this is the first one. This yeah. is the second one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, one is April and then that one is November. Yep. Yeah. All right. So three and four. That one I needs to be read. Do they have to read all of that? No. Just need to just need to read the title of each one. So you read that one, then all right. the title on those three. And then if I may be so bold, the yeah. capital improvement plan states that. Uh, sorry, the bug got my contact. Um, the yeah. capital improvement plan states that um, you that it is you be passing it, but it's on hold for second, third, and fourth resolution to see what happens. All right. Does everyone understand that? Okay, I will move for adoption of the following resolution. Resolution related to capital improvement planning. Um be it therefore resolved that independent school district number 2365 as follows the district sites and facilities should be positive contributions contributors to the educational experience of students and communities served by the district the condition of the district's existing buildings as well as improvements needed to meet evolving academic needs are of critical components for the long-term stewardship of the district schools. The superintendent and administration are authorized to direct and make plans for a special election to seek voter approval of issuance of school building bonds in order to finance the construction of the new 712 or pre-K-5 or pre-K-12. The superintendent and administration are authorized and directed to consult with the district's municipal advisors and other individuals as appropriate in connection with the 2023 election. No? The superintendent and administration are authorized to direct and consult with Carl Sanderson for the purpose of developing the scope of work as identified facilities project and the building improvements consistent with the capital improvement plan, budgetary considerations up to 43 million and other parameters that may be set by the school board. The long-term solution of the district's facilities needs is likely to construct a new pre-K-12 educational facility. The school board recognizes that such an undertaking will require support from the greater community, including voter approval, to secure the necessary funds to reach that goal. To that end, the school board intends to initiate discussion among school board members facilitated by Teamworks and the community regarding the prospects of developing a new educational facility. Teamworks will support the school board through board development through the process. In the event voter approval of a bond issue is not secured by the end of November 2023, the district will authorize one or more aforementioned non-voter approved financing options to provide funds for various repairs, improvements, and maintenance projects at the district facilities and sites, consistent with the district capital improvement plan and to the extent authorized by applicable law. Is there a second to the resolution? I'll second. Motion is made and seconded to approve the resolution. Any further discussion? If not, Julie, would you call the roll? Yes. Uh, 
has. Yes. Merkel. No. Brocknick. Yes. Keen. Yes. Lee. Yes. Thank you. Motion or resolution is adopted. Um, the next resolution and I'll move for adoption is as follows. Resolution relating to $8,780,000 general obligation facility maintenance bonds, series 2023A, stating official intent to proceed with authorizing the issuance and authorizing the superintendent or business manager or any such board officer to award the sale thereof and take such action, execute all documents necessary to accomplish the said award and sale. Be it resolved that the GFW School Board of Independent School District 2365 is follows. Authorization and district indebtedness. The district is authorized pursuant to Minnesota statute chapter 475, section 123B.595 to borrow money at the issuance of the general obligation facilities maintenance bonds. This board hereby authorizes the issuance and sale of general obligation facilities maintenance bonds series 2023A in aggregate principal amount not to, see, not to exceed $8,780,000. The proceeds of the bonds will be used to finance indoor air quality improvements and deferred capital maintenance projects district-wide as described in the district as provided in revised 10-year facility plan. Pursuant to the provisions of Minnesota Statutes 123B.595, Subdivision 5, it is hereby determined that the total amount of district indebtedness, indebtedness as of December 2nd, 2022 is $600,000. Um, the facilities plan will be submitted to the Commissioner of Education of the State of Minnesota as required by Minnesota Statutes 123B.595, Subdivision 5. The submission of the facilities plan and the requests for approval are hereby authorized, ratified, and approved in all respects. The sale and issuance of the bonds is contingent upon the commissioner's approval of the facility plan. Uh, the clerk is authorized and directed to cause notice of intended projects, the amount of the bonds, and the total amount of the district's indebtedness to be published in the district's official newspaper. The district has retained PMA Securities LLC in Albertville, Minnesota, as independent municipal advisor in connection with the sale of the bonds, PMA is authorized to prepare and distribute an official statement for the bonds and to open, read, and tabulate the proposals for the presentation. The board desires to proceed with the sale of bonds by direct negotiating with Robert G. Baird and Company Incorporated, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The superintendent or business manager and any other board member are hereby authorized to approve the sale of bonds in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $8,780,000 and to execute a bond purchase agreement for the purchase of bonds with Baird, providing that the true interest cost does not exceed 5.25%. Perfect. Adoption of, <laughs> of, of approving resolutions, state credit enhancement programs, and the official statement. Um, the expiration of authority. If the superintendent or business manager has not approved the sale of the bonds, to, but, but to Baird and executed the relative bond purchase by December 31, 2024, the resolution shall expire. Is there a second? Second. Motions made and seconded to approve the second resolution. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Julie, would you call the vote or call the roll? Lee. Yes. Ian. Yes. Rocknick. Yes. Merkel. No. Haas. Yes. Resolution passed. Um, the third resolution relating to determining, I will move for its adoption, to determining the necessity of issuing general obligation bonds and calling a special election. Be it resolved by the school board of independent school district 2365 as follows. The board has investigated the facts and is hereby find, determine, and declare that it is next necessary and expedient to issue general obligation bonds 
of the school district in an amount not to exceed $55 million for the acquisition and betterment of school sites and facilities, including but not limited to the construction of a 712 school building centrally located in the district. General obligation school building bonds of the school district in the amount of 14900000 for acquisition and betterment of school sites and facilities, including but not limited to additional construction for expansion of 712 site to a single pre-K-12 building centrally located within the district. Is there a second to that resolution to set the votes? Motions are made and seconded to approve the resolution to have a vote in April. Um, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Zellmer, would you call the roll? Keen. Yes. Racknick. Yes. Merkel. No. As yes. resolution passed. Oh wait, Lee. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you started with you. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> you get off in two weeks and you just forget about you. Right? <laughs> That's okay. I'm sorry. I thought you had already voted. I will move the following fourth resolution related to determining the necessity of issuing general obligation bonds revoking an existing referendum revenue authorization and replacing with the new revenue authorization and calling for a special election thereon. Be it resolved that independent school district number 2365 is follows. The board has investigated the facts and is hereby find and determined and declared as necessary and expedient to issue general obligation school building bonds of the school district in amount not to exceed 55 million for the acquisition, betterment, and sites and facilities not included, including but not limited to the construction of a 712 school building. Issuing general obligation bonds, another amount not to exceed 14,900,000 dollars for acquisition, betterment of school sites and facilities, but not limited to expansion of the 712 site to a single pre-K-12 building. Revoke the school district's existing referendum revenue authorization of $1,406.30 per pupil and replace that authorization with a new authorization of $996.30 per pupil, subject to the annual increase at the rate of inflation. The proposed referendum revenue authorization will be first levied in 2024 for taxes payable in 2025 and is applicable for 10 years unless otherwise revoked or reduced as provided by law. The question on the approval of the issuance of the above reference bonds um, shall be that district question one and school district question two on the school district ballot at the special election are held to prove said authorizations. The questions on proving and revoking the school district's existing revenue referendum authorization and replacing with new revenue referendum authorization shall be school district question three on the ballot at a special election. Passage of school district question two shall be contingent on the passing of school district one. The passage of school district question number three shall be contingent on passage of school district question number two. Is there a second? <coughs> Motions made and seconded to approve the fourth resolution. Um, Julie, is there any dis further discussion? Hearing none, Julie, would you call the roll? Merkel? No. Procknick? No. Or yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Dean? Yes. Lee? Yes. Oz? Yes. Thank you. Resolution passed. Yes. Um. I believe that's all we have on the agenda for tonight. We do have a regular board meeting coming up next Monday at 6.30. I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I'm sure there's this is going to generate some questions and some discussions in the community, but we look forward to getting the people engaged and getting the correct 
factual information out to them and hopefully they then can make an informed decision on the future of the facilities at GFW. I'll move for adjournment. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's being seconded to adjourn. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion carries. Thank you, everyone.